Hello, class eight students. How are you all? I hope all of you are absolutely fine. So today, from your textbooks, Prina Ma'am is going to teach you chapter number ten. Okay, and this chapter it is on page number ninety-three. So come on, quickly open your textbooks. All right, all of you are on the same page. Chapter number ten, page number ninety-three. What is the name of the chapter? The name of the chapter is a period of transition. Transition means change, some uh, uh, kind of uh, change which comes gradually. And what happens? The existing system is done away with, or the existing habits are done away with, and uh, something new comes up. All right. And what are the learning focus, or what are the main topics that we are going to study in this chapter? So we are going to talk about Renaissance. We're going to talk about voyages of discoveries, birth of reformation. That's the third topic. Then we're going to talk about industrial revolution, and lastly, we're going to, lastly we're going to talk about imperialism. So, in our previous chapters, we read that how India attained independence. How and what exactly were the changes that came in India? Now, in the following chapters we're going to talk about or we're going to study something about the world some phenomenal uh, happenings around the world and how these uh, happenings or how these incidents that happened in a few countries and few areas how these incidents brought about a change in the entire world so an incident that occurred in a particular country had an impact on the entire world okay so that's what we are going to study in the following chapters. Now, this chapter, which is about the period of transition, talks about something, some changes that started from about the 15th century, or that existed in a certain uh, custom, the system that existed in the 15th century, and then gradually people wanted to change those systems. Why they wanted to do so? Was there anything wrong with the systems that existed? Let's find that out. Okay, so. Talking about the first topic, which is Renaissance. Now, if you remember, when we started the previous chapters, wherein we talked about Indian Renaissance, I told you the meaning of the word. What is the literal meaning of the word Renaissance? It means rebirth. Basically, a change that happens, which is like a rebirth. Okay. So, this concept of Renaissance was not just limited to India. In fact, it came to India a little later. Before that, this concept had already started prevailing in Europe. Why? How? Let's see that. So by the middle of the 15th century, there was a marked change in the European life. Where were these changes observed, these phenomenal or these significant changes? They were observed in politics, economics, religion, and every aspect of the European society. The Middle Ages saw the birth of three epoch marking events. What were these? The Renaissance, the Voyages of Discovery, and third was Reformation. So these three, uh, you know, life changing or rather this complete transformation of situation changing events, these were witnessed by Europe. What were these? Renaissance, the discoveries through voyages, and third was Reformation. The Middle Ages progressed to the modern age with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It led to the birth of the Industrial Revolution. It led to the birth of imperialism, which affected nations all over the world. So we want to understand about Industrial Revolution and imperialism in due course of the chapter. Okay. So the movement of Renaissance, it began in Italy from where it spread to different parts of Europe. Thinkers and scholars like Ablat, Aquinas, Bacon, they laid stress on the, uh, they laid stress on the spirit of inquiry and reason. So basically, these thinkers talked about the fact that, you know, whenever someone uh, makes you believe something or someone says that you know this is a particular custom or this is a particular pattern of society or of human beings you should not believe all of that blindly try and see if there is some logic behind it try and find out a, a logical reason behind it. 
try to look at the scientific aspect of it. So basically, they talked about reasoning, giving reasons for things, giving logical reasons for the things or the customs that existed in the society. The invention of the printing press helped in publishing books and translate the Bible into vernacular languages, that is, into local languages. This widened the knowledge of the people. Scholars like Petrarch, Dante, Erasmus, etc., began to criticize the church priests and their traditional beliefs. They stressed on the study of man, his nature, interest, and daily life, and it led to the growth of humanity. So basically, these all these scholars like Erasmus, Dante, Petrarch, they said that you know the church is assume it has assumed a lot of powers and it keeps on misusing it. The church is probably trying to mold certain religious teachings only for their benefits. So, for example, in uh, the head of the church was called as Pope, P O P E, Pope, and it was said that he's the center of the court. So probably people should agree to whatever he says. So this person, Pope, because he had uh, unlimited powers, he would generally use it for his or his own benefit and for the benefit of the church. So basically what the church was doing now, that it was enjoying a lot of material wealth. It was drifting from the actual teachings of the Bible. Wherein, the, what were the actual teachings of the Bible? That was about serving humanity. So now when people started reading a uh, Bible in local land, in the natural languages, they started realizing that you know certain teachings that the church people are trying to uh, inculcate in us, that's not exactly what is quoted in Bible. And they are using it for their own selfish purpose. So now people started becoming more aware of the religious teachings and beliefs. So what is happening in this situation? The people are trying to reason out certain existing customs. And this was basically the beginning of Renaissance, wherein people started questioning the existing system of the society. Now, when we talk about Renaissance, there, uh, to reflect Renaissance, there were literary sources. Renaissance was seen in art. Renaissance was seen in architecture. It was, as we just started, that it was seen in all aspects of the European life. So let us understand about these aspects. Okay, so basically, the sources to study the period of Renaissance are literary and architecture. Literary includes the Divine Comedy of Dante, the famous Italian scholar, the Sonnets of Laura by Petrarch, who's the founder of humanism, and the Decameron by Bosaccio, the, uh, the Praise of Folly by Dutch priest Erasmus, and the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. The English poet. So, uh, as for the category tale is concerned, it's it's my uh, advice. You should read this. The very these are actually very interesting. So basically, the uh, names of these uh, uh, you know amazing uh, text is given here, which uh, make us understand about Renaissance. In architecture, we have or in art also we have Leonardo da Vinci. So we have all heard of the famous painting of Mona Lisa. How many of you know what is so? Uh, special about this painting of Mona Lisa. Have you observed, have you ever looked at this painting, if you've seen the image of the painting? Have you ever tried to see what is there? What is, uh, I'll give you a hint, what is missing in that painting? So it shows, it, it, uh, woman is uh, portrayed, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, you know, piece of art. It's a beautiful painting. The woman looks, uh, you know, she, she has this uh, very composed, and a mysterious smile on her face. But if you've ever observed this painting in the images that you've seen, if you've ever observed it carefully, it doesn't have eyebrows. Try and see it now. But it looks so beautiful. Then, so the Mona Lisa painting, right? And then uh, the Last Supper reflects the idea of the Vensa. The Last Judgment for Paintings in the Vatican and the Fall of Man by uh, uh, Michelangelo. St. Peter's Basilicia in Rome and the palaces of the rich noble families of Italy, especially Florence, tells us about the architecture of the times. In sculpture, there is David and Goliath by John Leto. And then, of course, Moses and the Pietra. Now, how about I tell you that I've seen most of these things? So, 
next summer vacations so you might say that ma'am in next summer vacations we'll be uh, you know uh, in another class so we won't be in eighth grade so uh, don't worry don't wait for summer vacation so uh, maybe what you can do is in your winter vacations or spring vacations you know whatever set of vacations you get try and see if you can go for europe tour of course with your parents you need to discuss it with them and uh, of course uh, see how much you're going to spend on that tour anyways that's that's just uh, i'm just uh, you know this just jokes apart so uh, all these places that you know you see in europe they're actually worth watching and it's 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 a beautiful experience because you come to know so much about the venice period now when this venice existed and you know when this uh, age of venice came it of course impacted various domains like we just started so what was the impact of venice on literature so there was tremendous impact of venice on literature as seen from the following literary contributions in different countries of europe so what happened in italy petrarch the father of humanism wrote sonnets of flora dante's divine comedy and uh, the bosche the father of italian prose wrote checkmate in england chaucer's the canterbury tales thomas more's utopia francis bacon's new atlantis spencer's uh, uh, spencer's fairy queen shakespeare and all his plays and milton's paradise lost all worth reading then in france also you had a few literary works in Ger in germany yes we talk about martin luther he translated bible into german so martin luther was one of those uh, known person or one of those known names who questioned the church he said that the practices of the church are corrupt it is the church is only trying to extract wealth from the people wherein its main duty is to guide people towards uh, you know achieving salvation Holland Erasmus Brace of Folly. Now we talk about impact of Venice on art. So we talked about Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting Mona Lisa and The Last Supper. Michelangelo's The Last Judgment and the Fall of Man. And then in architecture, Saint Peter's Basilica in Rome, Saint Mark at Venice, and Saint Paul's at London, the Pitti Palace in Florence. In sculpture, also I told you the means that existed. now what was the impact of renaissance a renaissance on science now this this was actually one of the major changes that came during the renaissance period that the entire concept of science the teachings of science that earlier existed they changed how so basically what happened you know that before renaissance came into existence people were made to believe that uh, earth is the center of the universe and you know all other body heavenly bodies revolve around it but when discoveries were made by uh, you know scientists like galileo and then copernicus and all these scientists when they came they gave the actual teachings or they act they told that how exactly the universe worked and how exactly science worked wherein galileo he invented the thermometer and modified the telescope and galileo was the one who said that the sun which is in the center of the universe and all other planets revolve around the sun but because at that point church was very powerful Galileo was punished. All right. Then Copernicus he wrote about the revolutions of the heavenly bodies. Wesley studied all the organs of the human body, and William Harvey discovered carbon dioxide. And for this, made it. So all these people uh, talked about or made these discoveries. Now we are going to talk about voyages of geographical discoveries. So basically, now what was happening in Europe? A lot of discoveries were coming up. Why? Because the europeans they wanted to travel the world so at that point of time technology was obviously not as developed as it is today but people wanted to travel the world they wanted to explore new places so a set of new discoveries came into existence so let's talk about these discoveries so the spirit of inquiry the need for spices cotton silk and silk goods made the europeans undertake sea voyages and discover new lands so there were reasons they wanted to travel of course because they wanted to know about the world they wanted to know what all other countries are there in the world and of course because there were demand of certain set of goods when the turks conquered constantinople the old sea route through the red sea and the persian gulf to the asian countries was closed so the europeans they had to find new routes how they were able to do that the mariners compass helped the sailors find the 
direction they were sailing into. So if you see a compass, if you've uh, seen, uh, here we're talking about the compass, which is, uh, you know, circle in, with a circular in shape and it tells you the four direction, north, east, west, and south. So, and of course, you can also, nowadays, you can also see compass in your phones. During the first half of the 15th century, the Portuguese were encouraged to explore the coast of Africa. In 1492, Columbus sailed further west into the Atlantic Ocean and discovered the islands close to Asia. So we've all heard of the Columbus. Now we talked about, talk about reformation. So people became annoyed with the corrupt practices of the Pope and his clergy. Uh, clergy. The Pope and his clergy led a luxurious life, like I already told you, that all they wanted to do was to extract wealth. Church offices were not given to the deserving, but sold for money. So imagine jobs were being sold in the church. The evil practice was called simony or simony, and a clergyman was required to pay his first year's income to the Pope, known as the Annette the First. Now, Martin Luther, I just told you that he was one of the first person who questioned the church. He led the protest movement against the Pope and the Christian church, which was also called as the Protestant movement. The Christian church was split into two groups. The Catholics who remain under the Pope and the Protestants who were against the Pope. With the breakup of the Roman Catholic Church, many rulers, particularly in England and in Germany, declared themselves as the head of the church as well as the head of their government. In this manner, nation states grew, uniting the people under their king to fight the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. So now the authority from the church was taken away at a, not many, at a lot many places, and it was king who was made as the actual ruler. Now we talk about industrial revolution and its impact. So while all these changes were happening across Europe, another change that occurred was the industrial revolution. So till the 1950s, sorry, till the 1750s, a domestic system of production operated in Europe. Domestic system means that people used to, uh, you know, manufacture goods at their home, right? So there was the concept of industries of factories as such. Whatever products were made, people used to make in their home and sell it in the market. The products of small scale industries were made at home by the family members. Through discoveries and inventions, a great change took place in the industrial sector when machine made goods began to be manufactured in factories. This transformation was also known as the industrial revolution because now goods were not really handmade, rather machine made. Industrial revolution means a number of changes that altered the methods of production and distribution leading to dramatic changes in the economic as well as social life of the people. A French socialist called Babel used the term industrial revolution for the first time. The movement started in England and then spread to other countries. And why did it start in England? First, because in 1700, England was not involved in costly wars. So it had a powerful navy to guard it. And as a result, the English people turned their innovative ideas towards bettering their like iron and coal the two main minerals required for industries for speeding up the production they were available in plenty in india due to the enclosure movement rich landowners bought the land of the poor peasants and enclosed the small plots to form large farms so what they did that they took many small pieces of land and converting it converted it into a single large piece of land the landless peasants had no jobs, so they shifted to the towns and cities in search for jobs. So now these peasants wanted jobs, and because the industries required labor, labor was also available in abundance. Electricity was available from the fast flowing rivers in England. So basically, hydroelectricity was generated, and skilled artisans who had migrated from Catholic countries to escape religious persecutions were available to work in factories. Again, labor available easily. England's naval power helped her to set up a colonial empire. The colonies served as market for English. But so basically what England was trying to do, it was trying to uh, conquer uh, countries uh, near about and some in Asia as well. Railways helped to carry raw materials and finish food faster. So first there was developed system of transport and communication and the English merchants had surplus money to send, uh, spend in setting up factories. What were the major inventions that occurred? 1773, John Kay invented the flying shuttle to weave cloth. 1765, 
James Hagey invented the spinning jenny to weave thread in a better way. 1769, Richard Arkwright invented the water frame, frame to prevent threads from snapping. And 1769, James Watt invented the steam engine. 1785, Ensman Cartwright invented a horse-drawn weaving loom. 1793, Ellie Whitney invented the cotton gin to separate the thread. 1811, Telford and McAdam invented a new method to make better rules. 1840, George Stephenson invented the locomotive, the engine we are talking about. 1815, Fulton made the steamer and John Smilton invented the modern glass furnace. 1838, the first telegraph line came into use and 1840, the penny postage was introduced. Now you must be wondering how are we going to remember all these inventions. So I'll give you a simple way out. Find out the photos of all these inventions, whether it was the flying shuttle or whether it was the spinning jenny, whether it was the modern blast furnace or whether it was the cotton gin. Find it out and on those, uh, you know, uh, take a, a little uh, big printout, maybe you can say, or maybe what you can do is you can copy those uh, images on a Word document and under those photographs, write name of the inventor and year and paste that on your study group. So every time you sit to study, you will watch it and you'll be able to retain it here. Okay. Now, what was the impact of industrial revolution? So we talked about the economic aspect first. The production of goods was on a large scale. Why? Because all that was required for production, whether it was land, whether it was labor, whether it was capital, whether it was organization, the factors of production and so forth, all of these were available in abundance. Okay. So there was large scale production. Next, the goods were cheap, but they were of good quality. They were economical and they were of good quality. The English people became rich and enjoyed a better standard of living and new towns and cities sprang up in England. The introduction of machinery, better seeds and fertilizer helped in growth of agriculture and increase in overseas trade, especially the colonies, which sent the raw materials and brought the machine-made goods led to the exploitation of colonies. That's understood exactly what they were doing in India. So what were the British doing in India? We started it, remember, that they would take the raw material, make the goods in England, and then sell it in the colonies. Itself. What were the, was the social impact? Small landless labors disappeared from the villages and became factory workers in urban areas. Factory workers lived in slums in extremely unhealthy conditions, and women and children were employed at even lower wages, though they worked for the same time. And society was now divided into two classes, the rich and the poor. The rich were the owners and poor, of course, the laborers. Political uh, impact, England became a dominant world power. It began to look for more colonies to get raw material and sell their finished goods. The Industrial Revolution marked the beginning of workers' movement against money-minded class. It led to the growth of socialism and capitalism. And unemployment rose with each new machine in the factory. The jobless workers rioted in protest. So there were a lot of people, a lot of women who had even, uh, you know, attacked this invention of spinning chain. Because if there's a machine, there is no need for a human labor. So people became shopless. Now we talk about imperialism. Now, despite all of, uh, there was some social unrest in uh, England. Despite all of uh, this, in you know parts of Europe, despite all of this, what was happening, it was still growing in terms of the power that it had. It, it could control a lot of foreigners. So they, these people, they became a little, not little rather, they, they actually became greedy and they wanted to conquer more areas that could be used as foreigners. And this greed led to imperialism. Industrial revolution brought about a dramatic change in the mode of production. Machines produced goods in large quantities that, uh, and they needed raw materials to feed the machines and new markets to sell their uh, huge surplus goods. There began a rush for colonization among those European countries. So basically, these European countries, like I already told you, they had this greed of colonizing as many nations as possible. What is the meaning of imperialism? It means the policy of extending the rule of an empire over foreign countries by acquiring colonies or by gaining indirect or direct control over the political and economic life of the natives. Does it ring a bell here somewhere? Isn't this the reason that the British came to India? 
So India was also imperialized by the British because it served as a colony and the British made certain policies which gave them political as well as economic control over the country. What were the causes? Of course, uh, because the European countries, they wanted to extend and they wanted to increase their political power. Then the industrial nations realized that obtaining more land would lead to more wealth. So they wanted to colonize. As industries developed in the European countries, the powers were forced to search for colonies to get raw materials and sell the finished product. The stronger nations became intent on developing its political and economic strength through war or trade, exploiting the weaker nations' political and economic limitations. And in the case of Britain, to make free trade easier for its merchant classes, Britain had to acquire colonies in Asia and Africa. And following the abolition of slavery in 1833, the British people made it clear that they supported spreading Christian and British morals to Africa. This acted as a political motivation in joining other European industrialized nations in the scramble of colonies in Africa. The British imperial government was aware that they could get gold reserves in Africa, which would, of course, add to their wealth. And industrial revolution had created rich capitalist class, which wanted to be more rich. And what was the impact of imperialism? So it had positive as well as negative impact. But a unified system of administration was introduced in the colony. So remember, we started uh, in, our in one of our previous chapters that earlier India was ruled by different rulers. So I'm stating the example of India here. Different parts were ruled by different rulers and there was different uh, codes or the different laws. But what happened here? Now, the entire country was brought under one civil code. So this is what the British or the imperial imperial nations did in all the colonies and of course they also uh, you know developed this uh, colonies in a way that they uh, you know introduced and improvised the transport and communication system then of course certain progressive laws and policies were also introduced the capitalists and merchants set up plantation industries as a result of creating jobs and industrializing the primitive economy but we, when we talk about the negative aspect of imperialism that kind of shadows the positive impact. It created a ground for exploitation of the native people. The crimes committed by the Europeans who were in the administrative post in the colonies created deep marks on the natives for years to come. The culture and tradition of the natives were completely looked down upon, upon by the imperialists. And the world witnessed many changes politically, economically, and culturally. New beliefs and ideas came into life, challenging the traditional setup of the society. This period of transition paved way for the creation of new nation states, which was based on liberal ideas. Now, how did these liberal ideas inspire countries like the US, France? We're going to study that in the following chapters. So I hope you like the story of period of transition. I'll see you all in the next chapter. Bye-bye, my dear students.